chapter 15, Mark chapter 15, I will endeavor to be a bit more brief today. I understand the community and the heat that is there, but I'm not promising anything, so it's uh, our best. But Mark chapter 15, verses 1 through 15 is where we'll be. Well, we all have a mirror at home, right? Everybody have a mirror at home? Okay. Everybody, I think, has one. Have you ever gotten up in the morning and you stagger into the restroom and you look in the mirror and you realize one thing? Wow, I am a person in need. Okay, has that ever gone through somebody's mind as they sat there looking in the mirror? Maybe your hair is all out of whack and so you're in need of a comb, some hair gel. Or maybe you got a, a, a full beard going on and you're like, oh man, I'm in need of a razor and shaving cream. Or maybe you look and realize, man, I have a forest growing in my nose. I'm a man in need of a tweezers, right? Has that ever happened uh, uh, to any of us? Sometimes we look in the mirror and the mirror shows us exactly who we are so we can make the changes that we need to make to make ourselves look presentable, right? And then you come to a human sanctuary and all that is gone out the window. Uh, but I think this ritual happens to most of us. We want to use the mirror to look presentable. It shows us who we are. And God's word functions like a mirror. In fact, the book of James calls the word of God a mirror. In that, it shows us who we really are. Because sometimes we tend to think we have a perspective on who we are and what we're about, but then scripture would show us differently. For instance, let me give you an example. Romans 12, 9. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. You kind of just live in life, and then you read this phrase, and you think, wow, let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. And God, through the Spirit, just uses that to convict you. Boy, abhor what is evil. Boy, that is some strong language, isn't it? I mean, we don't use the word abhor very often. And God uses that in your life, and you realize, boy, have I been abhorring what is evil in my life? Or maybe I've gotten a little comfortable. Okay, with things I just think that aren't quite so godly, but I didn't think were that big of a deal. Like maybe I laughed at an inappropriate video on Facebook, or maybe I've gossiped about another person, or maybe I just let my pride stick around too long. And you start to realize these little imperfections are what is evil in your life, and Scripture challenges you to abhor it, okay, because Christ is holy and is righteous. And so God's Word refines us, and it brings us back to the right way. Has anybody experienced this? before. You read God's word and it illumines things that you need to change in your life. And that's easy to see in a book like Romans, right? Because Romans has a lot of commands out there. Abhor what is evil. Okay, that's easy. But what about when we get to the book of Mark and we don't read a lot of commands because it's a narrative. It's a recount of events. It's a story. How are we supposed to let scripture be the mirror back to us? And as we read through a book like Mark, the mirror that God often uses when there are no commands around is the people, the characters, the personages in the scripture themselves. As we read about the disciples, as we read about the Pharisees, as we read about the crowd or the people getting healed, we're supposed to see the sinful imperfections in humanity because they're people like you and I, and we struggle the same way they struggled. And so that's what we're going to be looking at today. In the mirror of God's word, Mark 15, we're going to see some people there, and we're going to see how God would reveal to things about us through their experience. Okay, so we're in Mark 15. Do you remember where we were last week? Sham trial. Okay, Jesus goes in the middle of the night to, to uh, uh, the Pharisees, and it's just injustice everywhere. Lies, misinformation, accusing pe- uh, people, just railing on Jesus, and he lets it all happen. And so... Jesus admits, yes, I claim to be the Messiah, and even more, I claim to be God. And then they yell blasphemy. Whoa, a man can't claim to be God. And so they say, he deserves death. But the problem is is that the uh, Pharisees and the Jewish people cannot put people to death. Only the Romans can. Okay, And so that's why they're going to go to Pilate today. And let's pick it up in Mark 15, 1 through 15. And as soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council, and they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. And the chief priests accused him of many things. And the Pilate again answered him, Have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer, so that Pilate was amazed. 
Now at the feast he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked, and among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for him, that did for them. And he answered them, saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priest had delivered him up. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Our big idea today. The mirror of God's word reveals that we need Jesus, okay, that we need Jesus. We're going to look at four personages, okay, briefly this morning. We're going to look at Pilate, the the religious leaders, the crowd, and then lastly, Barabbas. And so that's where we're going, Pilate, religious leaders, crowd, and Barabbas, okay. So Pilate was the Roman prefect, okay, he's the top dog in the area. He doesn't usually live in Jerusalem, he lives over in Caesarea, but he comes to town uh, for the Passover. And so he's not a complete pushover, okay, all these religious leaders accuse Jesus, and so Pilate goes and asks him uh, what he's done. He examined Jesus himself. And it's interesting the question he asks, are you the king of the Jews? Now is that what the Pharisees and the religious leaders had the beef with last week? Do they care that he claimed to be a king? No, did he even claim to be a king? That wasn't even really talked about. What did they get upset at him for? Called himself God, right? The Messiah. Well, the Romans don't care about that. You can call yourself God all day long, and as long as you're peaceful and keep within the rules, they're going to let you go, all right? And so they didn't care about that. And so what the religious leaders do, they say, oh, well, he claimed to be the king. Okay, well, if he claimed to be the king in place of Caesar, then we got a revolution on our hands, and is that something that Rome would care about? And maybe put the guy to death for? Yes. And so they twist the reality to try to get Jesus to be put to death. And so we asked Jesus if he's the king of the Jews. And does Jesus answer directly? No, he says, it's a very cryptic uh, phrase in the Greek. You have said it. It's almost like, or like, whatever. Okay, he's like, whatever. Okay, whatever you're saying. Okay, I'm just going to go with it. That's kind of what Jesus is going on here. He doesn't really say anything. And so most people would be begging for their lives. But Jesus is quiet. He says nothing. And Pilate is a smart guy. Okay, reasonably so. He realizes two things. You see it in verse 10? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priest had delivered him up. I even Pilate saw through these guys. Now they just are jealous of Jesus. He's got all the attention. He's got all the power. They don't like that. And so they know, he knows that it's just out of envy that he's there. He also knows another thing, that Jesus was innocent. He knew that he was delivered up out of envy, and he knew he was innocent. And so if you were Pilate, and a criminal was brought to you, and you knew that he was there on false pretense, and that he was innocent, what would you do? Crucify him? No, the right thing would be to do is to let him go, right? If you have to shout to a crowd, what evil has he done? He's probably not deserving of death. Okay? But he doesn't do that. Why doesn't he do that? He's pressured from the crowd and that had gathered there. Do you remember what we talked about a couple of weeks ago, how adversity reveals the heart? Okay? Well, Pilate was in some adversity as the crowd is shouting at him. Did it reveal that he was a man of integrity and conviction? No. It revealed that he was a spineless people pleaser. And he sent Jesus to death just to avoid an uncomfortable situation. He gave in to the desires of others. It was more important for Pilate to please a crowd than it was to please God or even to walk in integrity in any way, shape, or form. But I remember we said that God's word is a mirror. Is Pilate the only one ever that has battled in trying to please people over God? Where we put him underneath others? That may be our problem as well, is the acceptance of a, a few people more valuable to follow than following Jesus. And we may not think of it like that. We may just think, I, I like to be liked. And is there anything wrong with wanting to be liked? Well, I hope you want to be liked in some way, shape, or form, right? Okay, people who don't care what anybody thinks are often rather abrasive, okay? But no, 
The problem is, is when we put that above our devotion to the Lord. And the Bible doesn't say people pleasing anywhere, but what does it call something whenever you have God and you put something else more important to that? I'm not about pleasing people, I'm about pleasing others. That's called idolatry, right? And scripture has a lot to say about idolatry. The first command, you shall have no other gods before me. So if you're into pleasing others over the Lord, then you need to repent because you have an idolatry problem. This is not just a little inconvenience in your life. Your relationship with God is disrupted at its core. And what Pilate needed to understand is that Jesus had all he needed. He sent to death the man, the only person who could really help him. Because you know what? If his security, if his safety, if his worth and value is all wrapped up in what God thinks about him, do you think he needs to have others to be his goal to please them? No. It's wonderfully freeing in Christianity how we can please the Lord and therefore we, our, our uh, situation does not hinge upon the opinion of others. Okay? Pilate struggled with pleasing people. Well, let's move on to the religious leaders. Okay? They don't care about pleasing others as Pilate did. They cared about pleasing themselves, didn't they? They stood there twisting lies all the while Pilate is trying to question Jesus. And even they manipulated the crowd and lied to try to get them to release a prisoner, a, a release a prisoner and a, a murderer. And what I think is always amazing is that the crowd goes along with it, right? They're there for Barabbas, and all of a sudden they're saying, crucify this guy they weren't even there for. But then at the second time, you think about it, it's like maybe it's not so shocking after all because individually we can be rather reasonable and talk through an issue but you get people in a crowd we start getting emotionally and passionate about things we don't fully understand i mean have you watched a political convention convention i mean that's kind of the mob mentality that is out there okay and so crowds can be easily manipulated but these priests are the leaders of the society here they should have known better it's too late though they're not going to believe Jesus no matter how many miracles he does or how much he shows that he knows the law better than they do. They are unteachable. And that was their problem. Their heart was hard and they were unteachable. I think it's one of the most dangerous positions to be at as a person is to be unteachable. Where you're so entrenched in your own world that your influence of others upon you just doesn't exist. I remember I went to a church with a guy, this was years ago, that was like this. He would show up and, and he would talk. He was public about his, his unteachableness because he'd show up and say, you know what, what's wrong with this person and that person? You know what's wrong with the sermon today is this and that. And he would tell you what he should have said instead. In fact, he would wear little slogans on his shirt that uh, is addressing his concern that he wanted people to understand, which it's fine to have an opinion, but for this guy, it was only a one-way street, Okay. He was giving out and not being allowed to be molded by anyone. But the very purpose of your life and mine is to grow to be like Christ. And if we shut others off from speaking into our lives, we can't grow. Now you may say, well, we have the Bible. That's all we need to grow. Well, the Bible will disagree with you. Ephesians 4, 11 through 12. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ. What has God given us to bring us to maturity? Yes, he's given us people to minister God's word to us. And you can't do Christianity all by yourself. It exists within the concept of a, of a church and connectedness to others. We can't shut ourselves off from being influenced by others. Proverbs 27:17. Iron sharpens iron, and one man sharpens another. you got a knife that just sits by itself being used. What's going to happen? No dull, right? Iron sharpens iron. We make one another better and helpful to follow the Lord. So how about you and me? Have we become unteachable? This is a bit of a weird thing to ask because I'm trying to teach to see if you're becoming unteachable, okay? The chances are, if you're unteachable, unteachable, you're probably getting angry. Because most unteachable people don't like to be told that they're unteachable. And so if you're angry right now, it's a clue that you're unteachable, okay? And so I'll let God work there, all right? And then I'll just move on. But the cost is too great to let ourselves stay unteachable. Because these chief priests, can you imagine five years ago, would they have ever said, you know what, I will lie to a Roman prefect. I will manipulate to get somebody put to death. I will twist words to get what I want. They probably would have never done that. But here they are. An unteachable heart has led them to do these atrocities. And it can work the same way in our lives as well. So we've seen Pilate, who is the people pleaser, the chief 
Priests were uh, unteachable. How about the crowd? The crowd. I was always mystified as a kid because, you know, the crowd always followed Jesus to a certain extent. They always wanted something from him. How come all of a sudden they're turning on Jesus? But then I realized is that this is kind of a different crowd. Okay, it's not the same people. Imagine like a, you could have a crowd at a uh, tractor pull and a crowd at a grand opening of a Baby's R Us. Those are probably two different kinds of crowds. Okay, two different DNAs maybe of who is going to be at those events. And it's kind of the same way here. Because look at verses 6 through 8. Now at the feast, he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. Are they even there for Jesus at all? No. Okay, they don't even know Jesus is there probably. Their concern was, it's Passover time, Pilate's in town, let's go get our boy, Barabbas, released from jail, because this is kind of a tradition that they had done every year. And so they want Barabbas, a murderous revolutionary, an insurrectionist, released from prison. Now what kind of thing does that say about the crowd? Is this the crowd of Babies R Us? Okay, probably not. Okay, this is a crowd that wants revolution. This is a crowd that wants violence, maybe, and approve of violence being used. This is a, a crowd that was concerned for insurrection. Okay, it's that kind of a crowd is what has gathered. But you know, it would be foolish to think that they didn't know who Jesus was, because everybody knew who Jesus was. But when it came down to a choice... Do we want Barabbas, who's concerned with revolution now, or do we want Jesus, who presents salvation before the Lord that lasts for eternity? They chose Barabbas. They wanted what is here and now, and said, forget what about tomorrow. Forget about the eternal perspective. Things were out of whack. Are we like them? Do we care more for the temporary things of this world as they did, or do our, our eyes on the Lord? Because Scripture points us, to follow him. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. Our aim in life is to please our Lord. It's the eternal perspective. But so many times as people, we get stuck on what is here and now. We get sidetracked on things like pleasure, fun, money, success, fame, all the little things of life. And we forget and we don't follow the Lord. A while back, my uh, kids were playing a video game. And uh, there was this aspect to a video game where you could change the, uh, the character's appearance and their clothing, okay? And so they would fire this game up, and the whole time that they were playing, they were just changing what the character looked like. Okay, that was all they did. And the rest of the game, the plot, all the levels, all the story that was involved with this game, they didn't get to any of that, okay? Why? Because they took one little tiny part of the game, and that's all that they did, okay? We can do that in our lives, God's will is to please Him. The game, if you will, is to honor Him for all eternity. But so many times we get stuck in one little part of life and we make our existence about that and we don't forget to follow what God wants us to do. We need to get our eyes off of the here and now, not wrapped up in all the things of the world and on to the Lord. The crowd wanted what was temporary, what is better is to want will last forever, and that is the relationship with God. So we've seen God's mirror. Tell us about who people are. Pilate was the people pleaser. Religious leaders, they were unteachable. The crowd wanted what was temporary. And that leaves us next with the most important person in this passage, apart from Christ. Okay? His name is Barabbas. And Mark wants us to really zero in on Barabbas in this passage because it mentions him several times. And remember, what was his crime? Murder and revolution. Now, if you try to in, in, uh, commit murder in a revolution here in America, what's the penalty? I think the punishment for treason is still execution, is it not? I, I'm speaking off the cuff. I think it is. And so if Americans are doing that, guess what Rome's going to be doing to a murderous, insurrectionist, revolutionary? You think Barabbas has a cross for, with his name on it? Yes, he does. Yes, he was bound for death as well. But did Barabbas die? No, he was released... The guilty one was released, and someone else took his place. What do you think Mark is trying to do by setting up the character of Barabbas here and mentioning him so focused? He's trying to get the idea of substitution in our heads. The, the person that was guilty went free, and the person that was innocent laid down his life and died in his place. 
You see Pilate, the leaders, the crowds, we may be like them, we may be not. But each one of us is like Barabbas. Each of us is guilty before the Lord. Each of us deserve the punishment of death. And like Barabbas, we have Jesus to take our place. Romans 3.10 None is righteous, no, not one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Well, that's rather bleak. All right, that's a, a kind of more of a downer part of Scripture, but because it shows us who we really are, that we're all sinners, we've all been corrupted by sin and experienced the guilt of turning away from the Lord. And what's worse in our culture too is we always victimize ourselves for it. The problem is always somebody else. But says so Scripture says no, it's our problem. We deserve the wages of sin, and what are the wages of sin? Death. Romans six twenty three. Each of us deserve death. I do, and you do. Because, but you see, like Barabbas, we were there uh, to, to go to that death, but that's not the end of the story. Jesus stepped up and took the punishment for you and I, didn't he? He deserved nothing. He was innocent, but he died in our place, and God put the sin of humanity on him. All of our lies, all of our lust, all of our cheating, our pride, our anger, our gossip, our unfaithfulness, all of our sin was placed on the innocent shoulders of Jesus. And that's what makes this passage so personal. Because we're Barabbas. We deserve that death. But Jesus died in our place. And he invites you to trust him. Because he secures our salvation, but he offers us to believe. To all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. You see, in Jesus, are we the lowly, despicable sinner? No, forgiveness comes in, and we're now what? A child of God. And that changes everything about how we live our lives and gives us the ability to pursue Him with our whole hearts. But He says, believe. And you can do that today. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, you can put your belief all on Him, and He makes you a child of God. Scripture shows us our sin. We shouldn't be like one who, who looks in the mirror of Scripture and just kind of walks away, content to be dirty. Nobody did that when they got up this morning. But Scripture shows us that we're guilty in sin. The response is to believe in the salvation of Jesus Christ, to trust Him for that salvation. And once you do, He gives us the ability to live life the way it ought to be lived. And if you'd like to know more, have some questions about, about following and trusting Jesus, then I invite you just to talk to me. we got air conditioning in my office, all right? Uh, and come back there and we can, we can talk about that and uh, would love to do so. But let's close in prayer. The mirror of God's word shows us that we need Jesus. May we respond to him today. Father God, we thank you for today. I thank you for how scripture illumines our way and lights our path. I just pray that you will just convict in, in each one our need to follow you more passionately and more fervently. Give us the strength that we need to do so today to make those changes to respond to what we see in the mirror. And Father, may we walk away further uh, following you uh, to the best of the ability that you give us. In your name I pray. Amen.